welcome to the January edition of Startup Grind. As we kick off 2020, we're really excited to have Stephen Plappert, CEO and founder of Forecaster, um, as our first kickoff uh, entrepreneur to talk to today. And we definitely want to thank Story for hosting us here in this uh, particular venue. So just so you'll know, we are here tonight. We'll be here again in February, and then we're going to start moving Startup Grind around to various different locations. Um, in the Louisville and Southern Indiana region. So you'll wanna check all of those um, particular emails when they come out. And I wanna also just mention and thank Bryce Hakama with Red Fox Media, who is capturing all of this excellent content for us. So thank you for doing that, we appreciate it. So we're gonna jump right in. I got a bunch of questions for yeah. you. And just so you all know the agenda, I've got lots of questions, some all about Stephen's entrepreneurial background, some about him personally, his entrepreneurial life, et cetera. But then for fun, I thought I'd throw in um, 15 or 100 rapid fire questions <laughs> at the end. So, and then we'll certainly leave time for audience Q&A um, because we want to take those questions. So Stephen, if you want to just give everybody just a really quick short uh, introduction of yourself sure. and we'll jump into it. Sounds good. Uh, I am Stephen Plappert. I am a Louisville boy, born and raised. I am an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I'm an adventurer, explorer, as Ken might say. Um, and yeah, that, you know, I, I, I love life. Um, there's enough about me. All right. So uh, just in looking in your LinkedIn profile and knowing you, you went to UK. Yep. You study math. Yeah. Numbers, right? But then right away, you jump into a startup. Yep. How did that happen, right? What was it that you intended to do when maybe you started your degree and then you jump right into a startup? Then? Yeah, I followed like a progression where I was in high school and I wanted to be an actuary. And I only wanted to be an actuary because I knew that I was good at math and that you could make money being an actuary. And then as I went to college, I kind of was like, well, there's more to making money and just doing something you're good at. You want to do something like you're passionate about. So I went into maybe wanting to be in like big finance. Uh, and I did some internships with some hedge funds and stuff like that. And as you might tell, I didn't really fit the mold very well. Uh, <laughs> so I just didn't really feel like that was the right like jam for me. And when we graduated from college, I had a really good friend of mine, Andrew Busa, who we started uh, Fantasy Hub with, his first company. And he came to me because he knew I was a math guy. And he said, hey, man, I have a business competition I'm doing. I need financial statements prepared. I was like, OK, cool. So like. What's your revenue? What are your expenses? Do you have any assets? Blah, blah, blah. He was like, no, it's just an idea. And I was like, well, like I can like print you out like a blank sheet of financial statements, but like you don't really have financial statements. Like you just have an idea. Uh, and he told me what that idea was. Uh, and that was the idea for Fantasy. Right. Yep. Okay. And so that's kind of how it all got started. So now tell us about Fantasy Hub, this particular journey. So you, you decide you're going to partner up at this point, you're going to jump into Fantasy Hub. Yeah. So let's give everybody just a quick elevator pitch. What was Fantasy Hub? Uh, Fantasy Hub was a daily fantasy sports for charity. Uh, so a lot of people didn't know what daily fantasy sports was, but it's basically uh, gambling. It's basically r wagering money online and like for fantasy football games and things like that. And you can win uh, real money. Uh, and we had a spin on it where uh, we basically said, hey, look, like if you win 100 bucks, you're choosing a charity too on the front end and you get $90 and the charity gets $10. Like there's a split there and the charity makes, makes some money. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we did. Um, and that wasn't the idea when we first started the company. When we first started the company, it was a much more horrible idea. Uh, <laughs> and we just kind of like tried to push that into the market and it failed and we pivoted. Um, so, All right. you know. So tell us what was kind of the business model? Like how were you planning to make money at this after the yeah. pivot? So after the pivot, when we ran these games, so the basically where it worked is that if we ran a game where you took in $10,000 worth of entry fees, you may pay out 9,500 of those entry fees where you know 9,000 9, of them would go to the people, 500 would go to charity, and then that other 500. And in gambling terms, it's called a rake. We never called it that because we were trying to separate ourselves from gambling, but it's basically the same deal. Uh, you, you take that rake. That rake is, is your revenue. Okay. Uh, and it's a really horrible business model for anyone that is thinking about <laughs> starting a daily fantasy sports company. Don't, don't do it. Uh, it's very variable and really, really hard to manage. I found that out the hard way. And that was one of my first lessons in business was like, you know, just like 
not knowing anything about business and starting a business. Like I didn't really consider business model or anything like that. It was more just like on a whim, like, Hey, like, you know, this sounds really cool. Let's start a company. And like, I am, I mean, I'm, I'm not you know shy of the fact that I come from privilege. So, you know, my, my parents and, and Andrew's parents gave us each $25,000, $50,000 to start this company, which was like incredible. And Friends they, they and viewed it, they viewed it as like, basically like my MBA, my graduate school. Right. And it absolutely was, I learned so much, but it was like, you know, not knowing anything about it when I started it, right. uh, I didn't really consider things like that and found that <laughs> out the hard way. It's really hard to make money doing that. And so. did you raise money for Fantasy Hub? We did. Well, we, I mean, we raised, we, I was telling somebody the other day, uh, because this new business that we'll get into later is, is much well, much better capitalized. Uh, Fantasy Hub, we survived for three years in the long run. We never had more than six months of capital in the bank. Uh, we raised money in five different intervals for like six months at a time, which is super stressful. Yeah. Um, but we started out with 50 grand from, my, from our parents and then got 50 grand from an angel out of Nashville and then 60 grand from uh, an awesome guy here in town named Chuck Schnatter, uh, who I used to hang out at his pool with when we were like little kids because <laughs> I was friends with his son. Uh, and then we raised about 300 grand uh, when we got accepted into Techstars Austin. Right. Uh, and then we raised another about 700 grand you know, six months okay. later. So a million. Total. Yeah, yeah, over a so million. Not and yeah, okay. not not too bad. No. Not too bad. Not too shabby, as they would Wish say. Wish I could have made them yeah. a lot more money. But. So as you've uh, as you've mentioned, tell us a little bit about your interest in applying for TechStars yeah. in Austin, right? Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know, TechStars, um, among a number of different business lines, certainly has some great accelerator programs. Um, why Tech Stars Austin? Tell us about the application, yep. the the opportunity to be selected. Yeah. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that yeah, like you mentioned Tech Stars does have different business lines. Uh, their accelerator is their really their core business. That's how they built their brand, uh, and it's in a phenomenal accelerator. It's a group of really really amazing people. Honestly, I didn't even realize the quality of the people when we did apply, but we knew that it was a prestigious program. We knew that Tech Stars was a really difficult program to get in. We knew that getting in would bring capital to the company or bring mentorship to the company. Uh, and really, it, it was it's not to my credit at all. It's Andrew. And it, he he saw the vision for wanting to get into Techstars. He applied uh, to three different Techstars programs. Austin was not the first one. We, we applied to Boston and got rejected. We applied to New York and got rejected. Uh, and then we applied to Austin and, and finally got in. Um, and and yeah, I mean, he he like made these crazy videos of the team and stuff like that without us even knowing and like made the application <laughs> and and we got through the the kind of uh, you know online application window there's like a stage where you apply online if you get through that you basically have phone calls with the management of that particular accelerator program and then if you're good enough they'll they'll bring you down to the city basically for like a final interview stage and those other two that we applied we didn't even get past the the online app Right. But he made this really cool, awesome video that I really think like made us stand out in this third application because uh, it was really candid. Like he did it like with his phone without us knowing. And so he's like all these candid like <laughs> moments in the company. Uh, and it kind of like and Techstars likes that, you know, they like to, right, right. to kind of see, you know, the, the real stuff, you know. And the so I th yeah, exactly. And they focus on the people. And so I think like he got us through that and then we just kind of we kind of shined. I was actually wearing these pants in the in-person interview in Austin uh, when I pants. went down there. These are my lucky pants. That's why I wore them today. Thank you. Thank you for gracing us with your Well, lucky you know, pants. it's the least I could do. Yeah. All right. So you you get accepted into Techstars yes. Austin, and now you're on a three-month excursion in Austin. Yes. So tell us what happens in those three months. What do you go through? Well, uh, so yeah, so we moved we we moved the company uh, down to Austin, right? And we drove a big U-Haul down to Austin, and like we all drove down there together. It was like sixteen hour drive or something like that in the U-Haul because it's really <laughs> slow. Um, and it was, but it was really cool. We 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 moved into this house. It was an entrepreneur house, and we ended up having enough people to take the whole house to start. But then as we stayed down there, people kind of spread out, and they just rented out room by room to entrepreneurs, which was kind of cool. Um, but you go through the program and like the first month is this really cool month that they call mentor madness where they basically just like throw you in a room with one mentor at a time, four or five times a day, every day for a month. So you end up meeting with like a hundred mentors and these are all really successful entrepreneurs, like typically entrepreneurs, but some angel investors and VCs as well, but all very res like successful, respectable people in their own right. And what you find is that all these people, when they look at your business, they give you a bunch of different conflicting advice and you're like, 
holy shit, like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, this guy's telling me to go this way, this guy's telling me to go this way. And you, and you basically realize that you can, when you kind of let all these things marinate, it can kind of give you, like, uh, some clarity on, on, on what to do in a strange way. Uh, but you have, a, you know, kind of a, 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 a part of the program that's like that. And uh, the this, this second month they call uh, just get shit done. And that's literally what they call the month. It's just about execution. It's about driving the most important metrics of your business and pushing things forward as, as much as you can. And then the third month is typically around preparations for fundraising. Most companies, mm -hmm. ourselves included, uh, raise money when they come out of a Techstars program. It's a great kind of moment where you have the attention of a lot of investors. So it's a really kind of opportunistic moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they do a lot of fundraising prep generally, uh, but they also have this big demo day like we have here, you know, with vote and stuff like that, yep. uh, where you're presenting to, you know, the community right. and kind of showing, hey, here's what we've done over the last three months. Okay. An investment came out of that for you? It did. Uh, slowly and very difficultly, we, we squeezed it out of there. Uh, we worked really hard to raise that round. Uh, I, woke, I was easily working every day at 4 a.m., and working really, really hard till like six, seven at night to try to raise that round. And Andrew and I almost killed ourselves raising that round. It was really, really hard. Uh, and we got it done just before the football season started. Uh, and unfortunately had a really bad investor lead that round that really ended up kind of mm. screwing over the company. So it was like really kind of salty at the end of the day. But uh, yes, we did, <laughs> we, did, uh, we did get that round done. Um, yeah. What was the most important thing you took away from that whole Techstars experience? Something that yep. you still kind of gravitate to even now? So I, so I actually have a really, really clear thing and it's really stark for me because when I went into Techstars and like when I was running this company in Louisville, I was like way over here on the spectrum. And then when I went through Techstars, I was completely on the opposite side. And that was around basically like community engagement. It's around basically just like human capital is what I call it. Uh, like when I was in Louisville before, I was very naive. I was very like confident. I still am, but I was very naive. And I was like, look, like I don't need mentors telling me what to do. I don't need to like connect with other founders. Like I know what I need to do to grow my business. And I'm too busy to get out there and like meet with other people, too busy to have a coffee. Like what's that going to do for me? I was very transactional. Uh, and that's a huge mistake because like at the end of the day, like business like any kind of business success, any success in life is people driven. It's, 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 it's all about people. And Techstars has that view. They're like, network is the thing. People is the thing. Human capital is the thing. Like that's the thing you need to focus on. And you need to really engage the community, engage your mentors, engage other founders. Like that type of like mantra, like going through Techstars, like really changed my mind on that. Uh, and it was really critical for Techstars. It's been really critical for me, like in my business career and also just in life. Uh, and it's been really helpful in this this new company too. How easy or hard was that for you to get out of that that shell that you had been in? You know, here you were going down originally this path of an actuary. Yeah. And now you're going to get out there and create this whole network and yeah, yeah. Participate. Well, I mean, like I fell in love with entrepreneurialism, like it, like from day one. Like I'm definitely like a chart your own course, like you know, plot your own destiny kind of a guy. And so once I got in that, I really fell in love with it. And honestly, like I went down to TechStars, yeah, having this mindset of like I know what to do. But like the vibe is so strong in Techstars of like engage the network and, and you're just you're like they have such a quality network that like you get in front of these people that know so much more than you and are saying they're giving you really good ideas. And you're like, oh, shit, like I should have been doing this a long time ago. Like it's it's really apparent. Like, you know, yeah. there's there's no other way. So looking back, if anybody's thinking about applying for a specific Techstars program and they're researching this, giving this some thought, do I want to go through with this? What are your words of advice for them in applying? Um, definitely do. Definitely apply. Uh, it's a really awesome program. And you said the right word, which is authenticity. Be authentic. Be yourself. That's actually like it's it's cheesy to say, but it's absolutely the truth. Like Techstars is looking for like authentic entrepreneurs doing really cool things. And the only way that you can really stick out is just to be yourself because no one else can copy that. So like when you're applying, like you, you just need to really like do your thing, you know, and if they, they'll pick on that, pick up that, then, then good for them, you know, but like, that's the key. Like team is the key, like your own personality. That's the key. Cool. Yeah. All right. So let's round out this story with fantasy hub. What eventually happens with the yes. fantasy hub? So it's a really sticky situation where basically, uh, we ran out of capital is the short is the short, you know, version of it. Uh, we died between seed and series a, 
Uh, we didn't really have the traction to raise a Series A. We could have raised a bridge, perhaps, in better market conditions. We did have a lot of growth over the football season, like after, after Techstars. Uh, but we had kind of a gnarly situation where a lot of the attorney generals across the nation uh, thought that what we were doing and what the rest of the industry was doing was illegal. And so a lot of attorney generals came out one month after we raised this 700 grand, uh, uh, you know, a lot of it from one single investor group. And uh, they, they didn't like that. And a lot of these attorney generals were like, look, like this is illegal. We want to regulate this. And so we had this situation where this, this big investor in, in the group had tranched their investment. They'd it was actually a $1.1 million round, but we only got 700 because they, they were 800K of that. And they were like, we'll give you 400 now and 400 later. Uh, and after that one was month went by. Was it going to be based on performance? It, it was based on actually this weird situation where this particular investor had a few years ago invested in an entrepreneur who had literally just like sucked the cash out of the bank account and went to Mexico. <laughs> and like no joke. Like, and so this guy had this really bad experience where like he'd been burned really hard by this yeah. guy just like doing something very illegal. And, uh, and so he was like, look, I want to put 400 grand in now. And 30 days later, when you do what you say you're going to do, I'll yeah. give you the other money. And I was like, look, I totally get that. Of course, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Like, so I didn't think anything of it. Right. But then lo and behold, 15 days later, the New York attorney general is like, this is illegal. And this guy's like, I'm not giving you any more money. <laughs> and so like, it stuck us in a really bad spot where like, right. we needed that 400 grand to basically persist on the other end of the, on the other end of the football season right. and raise a new round. Because uh, it's really hard to turn a profit in this type of business. Even like DraftKings and FanDuel, these big ones, uh, haven't turned a profit for a long time. So uh, long story short, you know, that put us in a cash crunch. We tried to turn on a dime and, and turn a profit. We couldn't do it. And so by February, we were basically up Schitt's Creek and uh, we, had to, we had to sell. And so we were lucky enough to like through Techstars' advice, like build really good relationships with competitors, which is another tidbit of advice. Like it's really weird. It's kind of a weird situation to be in, but like you've got to build really good relationships with your competitors because you just never know when you're going to need that relationship. And it's like an awkward conversation to have, but it's actually kind of cool. And we did a really good job of that. DraftKings basically bought our user base right. and then we sold a, uh, our technology to a startup in the space who was building their platform, but wanted to basically like leapfrog others. Uh, and, and we had really good tech. So they, we ended up selling that for like 400 grand, but only a hundred of it came in cash. The other 300 was in a note, which frankly I never thought that I would see, but somehow that company made it through the, the like valley of death, which was uh, daily fantasy sports and they're still alive. And there's actually a chance that we might get that 300 grand. So I've been talking to them about on a monthly basis. So ah. hopefully we'll get some more money for uh, <laughs> my dad back there. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Very cool. Yep. So at the conclusion of Fantasy Hub, yep. you do a 180. You're going on sabbatical. Yeah. Whole amazing trip. Talk yeah. about that. Well, I'll, ta I'll start, by, start talking about that by saying that, like, I was depressed uh, when, I'm, when Fantasy Hub failed. I'd, like, attached my identity to that company in, like, a very serious way, something that I don't suggest anyone do because like you are not your company, right? Like your company is just a, 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 something that you're doing. But I did that and I was really, really depressed. And so it was really, really hard for me to fail. Like I didn't, I didn't fail that often in my life and that was really, really difficult. So uh, coming after that was like a very deep, like dark kind of time for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took a little while to like get rebooted off of that. But I came back to Louisville and luckily my girlfriend stuck it out with me as we had done a year long distance when I was down in Austin. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I came back to Louisville and I was just kind of living, doing my thing. And I had a friend who, by the grace of God, really like had been wanting to do the Appalachian Trail. And he, unfortunately, like it was, a, it was a terrible situation, but like he got hit while he was on his bike on a car and broke his collarbone and couldn't go the year before when I was still running Fantasy Hub. And so like we went together, you know, that next year I was like, man, like I, I love hiking. I love doing that kind of stuff. Like, you know, I'm not doing this company anymore. I have the space to do it. Uh, so that's like what I wanted to do. And Emily did it with me. She was like, you know, that sounds really fun for me as well. And so, um, you know, we decided to do it together. And so I spent a year just kind of putting some cash in the bank and working with some companies here in town and in Austin, uh, just doing like fractional finance business work. And then, uh, we took six months and hiked the Appalachian trail, um, which was a really, really eye opening, cool experience. You know, it's a very different way of life. Right. Very reflective, very introspective, I would guess. Yes, it's very introspective. It's also very like, it's very, 
like opposite in the way because like and for most of us probably in this room like you we live a very like cognitive life a very like life where i'm like sitting in a chair all day and i'm using my brain and when you're out on the appalachian trail you're like your brain doesn't need to do anything it's just your body that's doing all the work and so it's this weird like you know like you know flip on your typical life which is also if it's just it like I don't know. It's like a really, really cool thing. It's hard to explain, but like, it's very like relaxing in a weird way. It's very like, it just creates a lot of space in your head because you're not like thinking so much. So your brain's not really tiring out. It's your body that's tiring out. Uh, and so like, yeah, it just like creates kind of a different like mindset, different state of consciousness, really. Right. Uh, and, and did you journal through this? Did you blog through this? I did. It's the only time in my life I actually journaled. Yeah, I'm not a journaler. I'm a numbers guy. Uh, but <laughs> I did journal during during this process and I felt really stupid lots of times doing it. <laughs> so I'm like, who wants to read this? And like, why am I ever going to look at it? But then I've now like looked at it since then and been like really glad I did because there's all these like little, there's all these little experiences that you have in life that you just don't remember. You can't remember. They're not important. Why would you remember them? But if you've journaled about it, if you've like documented it in some way, then you can read it and then you remember, you know, and it's like you can be back there and have that experience again. So I have, I, I was really grateful for that. All righty. So then you decide at this point you are going to come back to Louisville. So how do you mm -hmm. make that decision, right? So at the end of this huge, amazing adventure, you could have gone anywhere. Yeah. So I, you know, I often ask the question, you know, why coming back to Louisville other than family? Yep. So I actually, so when I was in Austin, like I realized something that I already kind of knew about myself, which is that I kind of like, and this is kind of like, sound like weirder than it is because I don't mean to say that like I'm hot, hot stuff, but I like being more of a big fish in a small pond. Like mm -hmm. I like to, you know, make a ripple. Like I like to feel like I'm contributing, making an impact, that kind of thing. And Austin, I felt like that, you know, that engine was rolling, like it was going and like I was just kind of along for the ride, but I wasn't really able to really like change the course of anything. In a place like Louisville, which obviously is my hometown, like I really feel like I can make a difference. I can do something cool. Uh, so I was really just ready to like be back here, be home, be close to family and stuff like that. But I actually left that com decision completely up to my girlfriend, Emily, because she'd never lived anywhere else. And I was like, look, like when we get back from the trail, like if you want to go to Denver, if you want to live in Austin, if you want to live wherever you want to live, like I'll move, I'll find a job, like I'll, I'll be good. And when we got, when we got back, she was like, you know, like we just spent six months, like living like vagabonds. Like all I want to do is be home. And I was like, cool. Like I was totally ready to do that. And so we settled out here. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Glad I did. Very cool. So you come back here and then that's when you strike a relationship, a working relationship with Venture First, which kind of brings us yeah. to the second half of your entrepreneurial journey. So, yeah. 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 I, when, and I'd actually, I'd worked part time for Venture First before I, I left and I, I ran into John at a coffee shop when I came back from Fantasy Hub and he was like, what are you doing now? I was like, part time finance work. He's like, I want the rest of your time. And that's how that's how it happened. We met at Please and Thank You over on, you know, right down the street, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and then when I got back, it was literally the same thing. I went and got a cocktail with John this time. We were at, uh, what's that bar that starts with a G that's by Louisville uh, Granville or something like that? What's it? About, yeah. 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 We were at the Granville and we were just sitting there and like, I was just like, yeah, I'm back. Like, I think I might want to like get involved in a startup. I don't really want to start something. I don't want the responsibility, but I want to work for a startup. And he was like, well, why don't you just work for Venture First? Right. And I was like, yeah, well, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And like, we just got to talking more about it. And so then I went full time at, at Venture First, like, uh, I guess, October of 2017. So tell everybody what Venture First is and what were you doing for them? Yeah. So it, it's hard to give like a one liner about Venture First because they do a lot of stuff. But the, the thing that I think that's most applicable to the people in the room is that Venture First is essentially like an outsourced finance team for high growth companies. So we operate as like a full stack finance team. We do CFO, analyst work, accounting work, like you name it. Um, and we, we sell that fractionally to lots of different companies. So we, you know, might be for two grand a month or five grand a month or whatever. It's just like hiring an employee. There's a cash portion, usually a small equity portion as well. That's vested over time and venture first just becomes your finance team. Um, so that's, that's what they do. And inside of that, uh, I was basically an Excel junkie. I was a, I was a financial analyst. I would build uh, financial forecasts and financial models for the companies that worked with venture first. I would basically be a, kind of like a VP of finance for them if it's an earlier stage company, quasi CFO until we hired real CFOs and, and took that away from, from me and Logan, which is really nice. Um, and yeah, we just kind of helped them. Any, anything they needed on the finance side, we helped them raise money. We helped them manage their cash, uh, all that kind of stuff. 
So you're working with obviously some startups along the yeah, way. Yeah, lots of startups. And realizing there's a huge need. And I was realizing that like, I was super envious of them. You know what I mean? Like I was sitting there like comfortable, comfortably making a salary for the first time in my life, which I really appreciated. But I was like, I was like working really closely with like 20 different entrepreneurs and seeing them go like chase their dreams. And I was here at Venture First, just like being an employee, which I like, which was really cool. And I love Venture First, but like, I'm an entrepreneur. Like that's what I want to do. And I was like seeing these people go off and do it. And I was like, damn, like I really need to be doing that. Like I really need to be doing this. And, uh, and I had had this idea uh, for, for Forecaster, Forecaster, which I called right. Crystal Ball, like be- shortly before I left for the Appalachian Trail, simply because I was working at Venture First. I was building these Excel forecasts. I was giving them into the hands of customers. And they were like not using them. They were hating them. They were getting confused by them. They were like, why is this so manual? Like there was all these issues with it. Yeah. And I was like, huh, like maybe we could make something out of this. And then I'd kind of like kind of forgot about it. And then Logan had had the same idea. And like, and Lo- so Logan's my co-founder back there, yeah. back there. And so like, I get back and we're quasi cube mates. We basically sit like back to back in the office. And one day he like rolls his chair back at me. And he's like, hey man, he's like, I had this idea. And he starts telling me about, about this idea. And I was like, man, that's a great idea. I was like, check this out. And I brought this, <laughs> and I pulled this deck up that I had made to like share with some friends. And we start flipping through it. And he was like, wait, you've had that idea too? And we we're like, yeah. And he was like, what do we got to do? He was like, well, we got we to gotta start something, I guess. And so that's kind of how it started. We were like, holy shit, like, if we both had this idea, right, right. it's it's definitely got some sort of a leg. So like, how could we validate it? Okay. So you start with the validation, yes. proof of concept. You're thinking about your business model, customers. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. And it's something I didn't do at all at Fantasy Hub, right? Like yeah. Fantasy Hub didn't know what to do. We were just like, oh yeah, we got the best product ever. Like, let's just build it and not talk to anybody and then like sell it to a bunch of people and make a bunch of money. And that didn't work. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> Uh, and so like this time we were like, okay, let's just talk to people about what they're doing and not even mention our product. Like we had 120 customer discovery sessions, which is how everybody should do this. We're like, we sat down with an entrepreneur. We said, how are you forecasting now? What tool are you using? How regularly are you doing it? What do you like? What do you not like? Blah, 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 blah. Asking them questions about their own workflow. They don't have any idea about Forecaster at all. We're not spinning it any way. And we're getting that kind of like unbiased information about what they're doing. And then like, you know, at the very end, we'd say, well, look, like, here's what we're thinking. Now, what do you think about that? Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of these conversations. It was quickly kind of apparent to Logan and I that, hey, this thing did have legs. And it was also apparent to us that like, we couldn't do this without Venture First. Like, frankly, we were employees of Venture First. Like the, the Excel forecast that we built on company time was, ex- was Venture First IP. Mm-hmm. And we had non-competes and all this kind of stuff. And so... There was a little bit of a pit in our stomach about like, oh shit, like, you know, like we're, we're having this great idea and like, how's John going to take it? John Shoemate this, is the CEO of Venture First. Like, is he going to like it? Is he going to see it as competitive? Is he going to say like, that's mine? And like, this is the, like, John is incredible. He's a good friend of mine. I love the dude. And like, he is exactly the type of people we need in Louisville because his response to us telling him about this idea that we had was so positive. And he was like, he was not territorial, like, hey, thank you very much. That's a new product line for Venture First. He was like, wow, this is really cool. It's going to hurt to lose like my two like anchor financial analysts, but like I'm willing to do that to foster entrepreneurship. And like, let's work together on this. Like, let's find a way that's mutually beneficial. Let's let you out of your non-competes. Let's let you out of any kind of IP stuff. And let's have Venture First participate in the company. And that's what we did. We basically split it three ways, essentially. We were like Logan, myself and Venture First was like kind of the initial cap table. Uh, and Venture First provided 30 grand of capital, which allowed us to basically build our, our MVP, build our initial product and get it to market mm-hmm. so that we could like do a bunch of testing with, with local entrepreneurs. A lot of people in this room, I, I definitely was like, sit down with me and like, let me show you this forecaster thing. Yeah. Um, and, and so we started to do that. And, and oh, by the way, this was all under like kind of the umbrella of Venture First in the sense that like until the end of this year, Logan and I were still employees of Venture First. Venture First still put money in our bank accounts, right? Mm-hmm. Like they gave us this kind of beautiful safety net to launch the company where they said, look, you guys can stay employees. We'll cover your salary and stuff like that. And like start to, you know, start to build this thing, start to build momentum, see if there's, you know, see if there's something right. here. And we released the product like in July of this year, we did a bunch of demos. And then over the, you know, butt end of the year, they let me spend three days out of five fundraising for the company. You know, like I had three full days where I could just work on Forecaster and they covered that. 
Um, and, you know, by the hard work of Logan and I were, and Venture First as well, Mark Crane and John Shoemate and guys like that, uh, we were able to put together the round and, you know, give the company like a really nice start, which cool. is something that we never had at Fantasy App, you know, like we never had that security. Right. And so how much have you raised so far of this round? How much is left to raise? Yeah. So uh, round's done. Um, vote was the first money in. We were a vote awards winner, which is huge for us. Like we got 25 grand and that allowed us to get our tech team started early. So we have two really awesome technical co-founders, Stephen Ams out of Owensboro and Jonathan Frazier out of, uh, out of Louisville. Mm -hmm. Both are amazing dudes. Stephen and I, and I work together at, at Fantasy Hub. And the vote money for that first 25 grand allowed Steven to start work in October and like start building, you know, kind of forecaster proper, like right. building us beyond this, this outsourced alpha. Uh, and then Jonathan started in December and we were kind of struggling to raise and like, because it's, we're super, super early. You know, I mean, we're, we're pre-users, we're pre-revenue for the most part. Like we're essentially just like an idea and, 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 uh, and a team, uh, right. And in this market, especially, it's a difficult thing to do, but it's absolutely not impossible. And I'm, by the way, not whining at all. I think that's a, that's one of my the, the things that I don't like is that a lot of a lot of founders just like to say, well, there's not enough capital or blah, blah, blah. And it is tough. But like if you're really out there with a good idea and a good team and you're and you do and you have the right strategy, you can raise money here. You just got to work hard. And that's what you should have to do. Um, and that's what we did. And. You know, we were able to actually oversubscribe the round. So including the vote money, we brought in 741 grand of capital, uh, which is two years of runway for us, even with no revenue. Uh, so we've got two years of job security. Mm -hmm. We've got two, two years to kind of figure it out. Uh, and we've got a lot more pressure on us than that because it's a really competitive space. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot of new entrants pop into the space. So like, you know, the pressure's on to move quickly, but we've got that kind of stability, which is something that I never had at, at, at Fantasy Hub, which just, it, I don't want to say it takes the pressure off because like the pressure is never off, but it does like it makes it less stressful. And as we all know, like stress is a blocker. It's not an additive. It's like like ambition is maybe an additive, but stress is like a blocker. And like and if you're really, really worried about like mm -hmm. if you're going to be able to make payroll or like if you're going to be able to stay alive, like it's hard to really focus on what you need to focus on to grow the business. You know what I mean? So how are you handling that stress so that you don't end up as you did with Fantasy Hub? Yes, uh, I meditate regularly um, and I don't work myself that hard. One of the biggest mistakes I made at Fantasy Hub was like working all the time. I thought like volume, 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 put in the hours and like that'll pay off. And what it did was it like it almost cost me my girlfriend. It cost me my physical health. It cost me my mental health. Like I burnt out six months before we shut that company down. Like I was like completely burnt out. Uh, and that's a really tough situation to be in because once you burn out, like you get, there's no coming back for that. Like it, it's, it's, it's tough. So one of the biggest things I'm doing and Logan and Jonathan and Steven all believe in this as well is like putting kind of like mental health first, if you will. And like not overworking ourselves. Like I work a 40 hour a week, period. Like I will work more than that. Like that, that's not a problem. I get excited about it. I work more than that, but like, I'm not expecting myself to work more than a 40 hour a week. Like right. I believe we can build an amazing company working a 40 hour a week. Like I think it's ridiculous sometimes that there's this like, <laughs> idea that you got to put in 80 hours and kill yourself to build something cool. It's just not true. It's, it's, it's about outmaneuvering your competitors. It's not about necessarily out hustling them. Hustle is a big, big piece of it, but I think it's about kind of working smart. Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, and then very recently you and some of the venture first team take another amazing. Yes. Adventure. That's well, and that's, and that's the other way that I yeah. keep my mental health, you know, is like going on adventures and like taking time off. I didn't take a single vacation for the three years that I worked at Fantasy Up. I didn't take a single week. Like, you can ask my parents. I was working all the time. Like, we would we'd go down to our condo in Florida, and I was working the whole week. Like, it's just the way that it was, and I thought that's what I had to do. But, like, time off is super valuable. Like, as we all know, like, sometimes, like, you're struggling with a problem. You got to go, you know, I don't know, play a game of tennis is what I might do, and then come back, and all of a sudden you have the solution. Like, your brain has a weird way of, like, yeah. marinating in the subconscious. And so that's, you know, we just took – and this was in the middle of a fundraise, something that nobody would ever advise you do. But like, I'm dead in the middle of a fundraise. And I'm like, see you guys. I'm like three weeks out on this mountain that some people die on. Like, I'll come back and finish the so race and I get back. The yeah. <laughs> so uh, we went and hiked Mount Kilimanjaro in like early November. Uh, and it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Nature's really cool. It's super like picturesque mountain. And like, I mean, it's really, really cool to hike. Africa is just amazing in general. I'd never been there before. So. 
um, yeah, it's an All awesome right. experience. All right, and the current status of Forecaster at this point? Uh, the current status of Forecaster at this point is we are really early stage, but we're kind of crushing it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like we've like we, I mean, we oversubscribed our round. It's we the got lucky pants. It's the lucky pants, <laughs> and it's the team, and. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we really have, we've like, because of this thing I talked about earlier, like the human capital piece, because of putting that first and because like, like 15 months, 18 months ago, and some people probably know this, like we were out there when we were doing that early customer discovery, we were also meeting with Leaf as a Bajornis and we're meeting with, you know, Zach Pennington, we're meeting with Amanda Bates, we're meeting with everybody here and saying like, hey, this is this idea. This is what we have. This is what we think. We have absolutely nothing right now, but like, let's put you on an update list. You know, like, let's get you, let's keep you plugged in about what we're doing. And like, let's put people first. Let's 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 value human capital. That's what we've done, yeah. and we've done that from the very beginning. And so we've built a tribe, we've built a community, we've built a village around what we're doing, and it's paid huge dividends. Like, we have an incredible team. It's allowed us to raise two months or two years worth of capital, which is amazing. Um, and it's got some other really cool things for us that uh, I can't share right now, but uh, <laughs> it will be public soon. All right. Um, cool. So yeah. So what do you want to do? post forecaster right and, and what's the exit plan for forecaster do you know at this point have you thought that through yet we've talked about it but it's it's you know it's silly to talk about but you still talk about it because you can't not yeah. um but you know look i mean there's a lot of different things that, that could happen i mean the, logan and i absolutely believe this is this is a billion dollar business it absolutely could be if we want to take it that far will we take it that far i have no idea like i'm a, i'm a person that believes in like you know, if someone showed up today and said, hey, I'll give you $10 million for this company, like, I'd be lying to you if I wouldn't say, Logan, let's go into that office and let's talk about this. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's that's the kind of thing. So from an exit potential perspective, it could be a billion. It's just a matter of do I want that kind of responsibility for that long? And is that what we want to do as a team and yada, yada? But like, it could be a big exit. It could be a cash cow that we just like keep as an annuity and hire a management team and become, you know, board of on the board and that kind of thing. You know, it's like all that kind of stuff. But uh, you know, I mean, as a, as a guy in his twenties, like if I have a chance to make a couple million bucks, like I'm going to think about that. <laughs> uh, and like, as far as what I want to do after, like, I'm like a big proponent of, you know, living life and, and living large. So like, you know, if, uh, if it went well, uh, I would definitely take a decent chunk of time off being, being young and just like have an absolutely great time, do a lot of travel and read a bunch of books and learn some languages. Uh, and then I would probably get back to some cool stuff. Like, I don't know what it would be, but like, it would be something that like, you know, would be beneficial and, and impactful. And I'd kind of like, you know, take it as it goes, I guess. All right. um, so you've mentioned uh, vote awards that you participated in. Yeah. What, what else in our local entrepreneurial ecosystem in terms of resources have you taken advantage of that you think was really beneficial? What's been most helpful for you? Most helpful for sure has just been like, I'll say mentors, but that just means like peers and everybody I've been talking about, about how, like we have, I think like over 300 people on this company update list. And like the vast majority of these people are just people that are in the local ecosystem that like we've talked to and we respect and we value. Like that's the, that's the secret sauce resource that honestly every community has, but Louisville definitely does as well, which is just like a bunch of cool people doing cool stuff. And you can access them. That's one of the key things about Louisville is the access. Like you can access almost anybody in the city. It's really, it's just really just a matter of like hustling and asking around, like, do you know this person? Do you know this person? And so that was the biggest, that's the biggest like resource that we've, that we've basically capitalized on is like everybody in this room, you know, it's like just like sitting down and being like, Hey, this is what we're doing. Getting coffee with people, being present, not being like transactional and like sitting down and saying, Oh, I want this thing from you. And Oh, I want this thing from you. Like it's just sitting down and being like, Hey man, like, how's it going? Like going to Founder Beers after this and being like, what's going on with your, in your world? Like, how was your holidays? You know, not necessarily mm -hmm. always talking about, you know, transactional related stuff, right? Um, that's kind of like the biggest thing that, that we've been able to, to capitalize on because there's just this weird way that like, if you go out there and you just talk to a bunch of people and you just kind of put yourself out there and, and do your thing, mm -hmm. stuff just kind of comes back around. Like, I don't know how it works, but it does. Um, and that's, I think, what's paid a lot of dividends for us. Cool. Um, and what is it that in, you know, your time spent in Austin, elsewhere, you come back here looking at our ecosystem, what is it that would still be helpful if there were that particular resource or more of that resource? What would that be for you? Um, 
I think there's, I mean, it's nothing that we don't already know probably, but like, I mean, access to technology talent is like a huge, huge thing. That was something that like down in Austin, like I needed to hire a front end developer. Like I got 10 apps in a, in a week. It was really no problem to hire somebody of that stature. So like technology talent and finding a way for U of L to like really turn that engine on and like crank out solid talent would be really good, I think. Uh, certainly some sen- like some sort of a venture fund. It doesn't matter how big, you know, C3, I candidly, and I'll say this publicly, like I think they have a huge opportunity to steer a little bit more of that capital towards like early stage stuff. Mm-hmm. I know they want to do later stage stuff and I think that makes a lot of sense, but like you can carve out a tiny piece of that. You can play small bets and make make an impact. Yeah. I think that's I think that's needed. Um, so some some sentiment of like institutional capital would definitely help. Uh, and then it's just like a mindset, which like, you know, I mean, I'm a huge like Techstars fanboy and like it's a great organization. They bring a good mindset, which is just founder first. It's simple. It's give first. It's founder first. It's like put, on, put entrepreneurs at the center and, and let them drive stuff and like give without any expectation of receiving. I mean, if, if we can generate more of that mindset, I think we got a really good opportunity. So. So this is the usual attire that I often yeah. see you in, right? Not always the lucky pants, but thank <laughs> you for that today. Yeah. But there's this whole other unique outfit that you occasionally wear. I think it's every Thursday. Yeah, every Thursday I wear a Talk three-piece suit. Yeah, go ahead. I Tell wear a story. three-piece suit every Thursday. It's called three-piece Thursday. It's just my thing. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. There's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a funny story tie. behind it. A lot of times it's a bow tie. So yeah. so when we launched Fantasy Hub, I worked uh, at Joseph A. Bank in the Summit, now the Paddock Shops. Like, that was my day job. That's how I, I, I paid for myself. And I wore a suit every day, obviously. Like, I wore a suit when I was at that job. And then uh, I quit that job, and I started Fantasy Hub, and, like, I was just in, like, a T-shirt and maybe pants, like, in my apartment every day. <laughs> And like, <laughs> you know, pants. maybe pants. Like I was like nothing. And I was just sitting there like jamming away. And I at one point was like, huh, like when you dress really nice, like when you go out to a nice event or you get really dressed up, like you feel different. You feel different about yourself. You behave differently. It's just like a human thing. And so I was like, huh, like I kind of want that. But like if you don't, if I don't apply some structure to it, it's just never going to happen. And I was, I was always kind of a fan of the three piece. I like the vest. I just like how it feels. And it like just rolled off the tongue. I was like three piece Thursday. <laughs> And so I started this at Fantasy Hub. I was just like, every Thursday, I'd just pop on a three-piece suit, right. and that's what I did. And here we are. I'm still doing it. Good. Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. Three-piece Thursday. Mark that. That's right. Yeah. All right. I, I am taking, you know, additional members into that community. If anybody else <laughs> wants to start, like, it doesn't have to be just my thing. It just is right now. So. I've got about 15 really quick rapid-fire questions for you. Right? All right. So really quick. So. Cards or cats? <laughs> Cards. You went to the cards. Yeah, I did. What famous person, living or dead, would you like to have dinner with? Oh my gosh. Uh, Jim Morrison. Favorite TV show? Breaking Bad. What did you want to be when you were five years old? <laughs> NBA player. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Favorite movie of all time? Oh gosh. Um. Ooh, Cloud Atlas, for sure. Where is your next vacation going to be? Uh, my next vacation, I guess, will be going to Wimbledon with my father. All right. Yeah. Um, favorite protein? Favorite protein. I thought you said favorite protein. I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, Chicken. Yeah, beef. Probably, probably beef. Uh, <laughs> protein. <laughs> Favorite pro team? Uh, I was so I was always a huge like Kobe fan, a huge Lakers fan. So that's probably still it. That or the Steelers. I'm also like randomly a Steelers fan. Okay. Dark chocolate or milk chocolate? Dark chocolate for sure. Biggest pet peeve? Biggest pet peeve. Ooh yeah. I hate it when like you're like you have the, there's kind of like a long line at like an exit and some asshole like goes right up to the exit and like cuts over, you know, and just like thinks he's cooler than everybody else. Like, it really annoys me. Like I don't ever get road rage, but like when someone does that, like, it's, <laughs> it just pisses me off so much. I hate it. I've got a couple more. This is going to give you enough time to be kind of be thinking of your questions from all of you that you can ask Steven. So um, who's in your playlist right now? Who's in my playlist right now? Always My Morning Jacket. Always use like Blitz and Trapper, like Tame and Paula. I said Jim Morrison, the doors are always there. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, last book. 
that you read? Last book that I read was The Alchemist, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I read The Alchemist. I had been like, it had been suggested to me, it was either The Alchemist or Life of Pi. I read them like really close, but both of those books were like kind of like classics that I'd never read or whatever that people always told me were good. And I borrowed both of those books from others and I still have them. It's on my to-do list to send those books back to their owners, <laughs> but they were both really good. If your house was on fire, what are the two things you're going to go back and grab? Uh, if my house was on fire, uh... If Emily's in there, I'm definitely grabbing her. Um, she might be sleeping. Um, other than that, man, oh, yeah, yes. probably, <laughs> definitely the pants, definitely the, the pants. Um, shoot, I don't even know what would I grab. What's like my m most favorite item? I have no idea. We'll go with the pants. The pants. We'll just, I'll just get the pants and Emily. That's all I need. Best gift you've ever received. Best gift I've ever received. Um, shoot, something from my parents. I mean, the one, a notable one, I don't know if it's the best, but it was awesome. It was like one Christmas, we were kids, we get up, we get up there and like, well, Santa gave it to us, but we, we get to the tree and there's a little air hockey puck and these air hockey pucks were following in a little, like a breadcrumb trail. We're following these air hockey pucks and like get all the way downstairs, boom. There's a full air hockey air table hockey. in our back in our down in our basement. We awesome. lost it. We absolutely lost it. I don't know. I still don't know how Santa got it in without us knowing, but he did it. Very cool. So. Um, favorite restaurant or hangout? Ooh. So favorite like favorite restaurant or hangout? I mean the place that I hang out probably the most is like Gravely Brewing. Um, it's not really a restaurant, but I definitely hang out there. Or like Sergio's. I really like Sergio's. Um yeah, and I mean, I don't know if it's my favorite, but because I like a lot of stuff. But I love Toast on Market too. Okay. I usually go there, go there for breakfast. Me and Logan went there for lunch the other day. Lemon souffle pancakes. Huh? Lemon souffle pancakes. No, no, the yeah. Hasbro casserole though, oh, for sure. Okay. And I usually get like the BLT scramble or something like that. <laughs> All right, here's my last rapid fire question. So then we'll take audience questions. What's your superpower? Ooh, what is my superpower? I think my superpower is like being is like being absolutely outrageous but convincing people i'm legit <laughs> because like i do this <laughs> i do this a lot i do this a lot it's that juxtaposition right? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i think that's my superpower i literally i went to cincinnati for like a pitch to like qca like a few months ago and it was and i was pretty much like looking like this and uh and i just like absolutely crushed this pitch like we've all had days where, like some days you're on some days you're off and i had one of these on days where i was just like bang 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 i absolutely crushed this pitch and they're like five of the dudes came out after this and were like who are you basically <laughs> they were they were they were like they were like i really they were like legitimately like i don't know what to think of you because you look like outrageous but like you're saying all the right things they were like i don't know what to i don't know what the box <laughs> to put you in and i was like that's why i look like this i do it strategically because like i want to reset those like weird norms like people like people just straight up judge people and i kind of like getting judged and then busting through that you know so all right. that's my super very bad. good